welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. So feel free to put your hand up, ask us a question, ask us to clarify something if, we, uh, if, you, if you needed to, to get into it a little more, because we're going to go over a lot of stuff, uh, and some of it might be a little quick. So please, and make sure you're in a place where you can, can see everything. Um, so let me, let me tell you who we are. So we're the Sun Brothers. We've been making comics now since, uh, I guess you moved to Chicago in 2011, yeah, right? at the end of 2011, and we are poised to release our third uh, book in three years. Okay, so our first book, which we talked about last time we were here at Wednesday Lunch, is called Chinatown. This is our first graphic novel. It's a haunted house, um, kind of psychological horror book about a girl who goes missing in Chinatown. Uh, it's, uh, it's told in the genre of magical realism, and stranger and stranger things happen as the town begins to unravel, uh, and you kind of follow this town through. That was about, it was like 120 pages, yeah. uh, was Chinatown. Uh, soon after, we released our follow-up book, Apocalypse Man. Uh, which was our response to the ubiquitous uh, zombie literature that's out there. So this is our survival horror book. Uh, it was a black and white, um, kind of staple-bound floppy piece. How many pages was it? About 50, 40 pages? 40. 40, 40 some odd pages. Um, and that came out uh, in the spring of 2013. Uh, and then now we're poised to release our latest book, Monkey Fist, which is a retelling inspired by uh, the Monkey King stories from Chinese literature, but it takes place in a fast food restaurant. Uh, so it stars our, our hero there, Monkey, who works for Fishy Burger, our uh, corporate fast food chain, and he decides one day that he just has to know what's in the, where, where Fishy Burgers come from. And so he heads down to the corporate offices to find out and runs into all kinds of adventures and mysteries and danger uh, when he's down at Fishy Burger HQ. Uh, so that's, that's Monkey Fist. I'm going to talk, we're going to talk a little bit of, uh, more about it later in the presentation, but that's what's next for us. Um, before we kind of delve into comic books as art objects, I wanted to say just a little bit about what we mean by comics. There's been a lot of literature, um, I guess, since the 80s, uh, trying to define comics, and so one of the more famous definitions is comics as sequential art. Um, uh, it's just coined by Will Eisner. Uh, 1985, but a lot of what I'm talking about is uh, based on the work of Scott McCloud, who in 93 uh, produced a book called Understanding Comics, which is actually up here if you want to take a look at it um, after the presentation. So in his uh, comic about comics, so the book is a, is a comic, and it's talking about how comic books work, he tries to come up with a definition of comics, and after a while he kind of gives up, but the farthest he gets is uh, juxtaposed pictorial and other images in a deliberate sequence. Uh, and then I don't know if you can see it, there's a word balloon where somebody says, what about Batman? Shouldn't it have Batman in it? And somebody else says, who let that guy in? So you know, it's hard to define how comics work, but it's words and text uh, and images working together in sequence to tell a story. Um, now, the, what I want to point out is that in comics, the storytelling is, is in some ways more interactive than a lot of other kinds of literature. You know, when you're watching a film or reading a prose-based book, for the most part, um, a lot of the editing is done for you. You know, like uh, the pacing, the, the time in, say, a movie is done for you. You're not really expected to pause the movie kind of where, where you would have breaks, right? Or rewind and, and rewatch it. Um, but in comics, you necessarily have to as a reader. So in McLeod's book, Understanding Comics, he, um, in one of his illustrations, he does this single panel comic, okay? And he says, you know, you might think that panels are freeze frames, you know, moments in time. But in fact, 
there's time that passes within the panel. So I'm not going to read this whole thing, but if you see it, in this panel is a bunch of things that necessarily impose an order. Like a guy who snaps a picture and says, smile, and then the other guy says, oh, that flash blinded me, right? So really, one thing had to happen before the other. Same thing with the guys playing chess over there. And so as a reader, you split up and you pace out how the panel works in each individual panel, but also in the timing between panels. So kind of necessarily, you're like the editor in a film whenever you read a comic. So the point here is that comics are an interactive medium to tell stories. So I'm going to turn it over to Brad, and he's going to talk about comics as art objects. Right, so the crux of what we're going to talk about here is, um, as you said, comics as art objects. So I'm going to kind of talk real quickly about what we mean when we say art objects. So here's a self-portrait by Vince Van Gogh. But of course, this isn't actually a self-portrait by Vince Van Gogh. This is a computer file that's been projected onto a screen that shows an image of self-portrait by Vince Van Gogh. If you want to see the real self-portrait by Vincent Van Gogh, you have to go to the Art Institute and look at it. And if you actually have had the chance to see the original, or you know, you do know them, you'll see that I'm not being just pedantic here. It's quite different than seeing an image of it. You'll see the physicality of it right away. Um, and this is true with all paintings, perhaps more dramatically with someone like Van Gogh, who really kind of slathers the paint on like mud, which is what oil paint is actually mud. Um, so you see that there's a physicality to it. That, that it's not a flat you know, image. These like little dots of color are actually you know, actual like physical objects on a piece of fabric, and the, the, there's little peaks and valleys across the canvas. And so, you realize that this painting isn't really the image, that's not the art. That's what we buy, when we, that's, that's a reproduction like this, that's what we buy like, as a poster to hang in our dorm rooms or whatever. But the actual painting is, a, is an object. Um, it is, you know, wood and canvas and mud and the paint put together, and that is the art. So there's a way that you can look at all art, at least all physical art, as kind of a sculpture. It's not just the image, but it's all the physicality of it that makes it, um, makes it an art object. And so um, when we uh, apply that to comic books, it becomes a little bit more interesting because, as I said, um, we're used to seeing an original art piece, like the painting in the Art Institute, and we're used to seeing reproductions of it, either online or in magazines or posters. Um, and, and it's very clear which one is the quote unquote real art object and which one is the reproduction. Uh, for comics, it becomes a little more complicated because it is a mass produced medium. It's meant to be printed as a book. So, what the original is, is it's harder to, to see. So, this is a show, a gallery show I was in um, last year of comic book art. Um, this is the comic book original art page. This is what I drew on my drawing table before it was printed into a book. Um, so, as you can see, it's, it's a little strange because in some ways, people are looking at the original drawings that I did on my drawing table as the art. But in truth, at least in my opinion, uh, it's the printed book that is the, the true art. These are just the component pieces that create the original thing. So it's kind of backwards from how traditional art would be viewed as there's one original and there's a bunch of reproductions. In this case, the, the unique elements are just part of the, uh, the original art. And the true art is the mass-produced object, is the printed book that, you know, there's and as many copies of it as you want there to be. So, let's talk about uh, what actually a comic book is. Now, sequential art, as the Mucky Mucks call it, um, <laughs> has been around since as long as people have been around. But actually, what we think of as comic books is not that old. Uh, sometime in the 1930s, there was some newspaper guy reading a paper, and he realized, hey, well, that's a pretty handy way to print a book, and you can staple it, and it's easy. And that's pretty much how comic books have been since then. There's been a few dimension changes, but that's all it is. It's a newspaper folded in half twice. That's how the dimensions were choosing. And they're, they're just, there's some kind of obscene. It's like 6.125 by 10 point. It's, it's not, it's a weird dimension. And it's all just because a newspaper folded in twice is an easy thing to print on. So it was not an art decision. It was a practical decision. And that's how, that's what we think of as comic books. That's what, uh, Chinatown and Papu's Man were printed on, and uh, that's what that's what the expectation is. But you know, um, something happened, which happens with all art, is uh, eventually a generation comes of age that grew up with the comic book as this, and they no longer saw it as some, something different than any other kind of art. It was it, it was art in and of itself, and so people could start. And because comics were starting to be seen as art, uh, they could they started evolving quickly into different forms of medium. So one of those things that came about in the '70s was the graphic novel, which is, as opposed to an ongoing kind of periodical comic book that comes out weekly or monthly, a self-contained story that could be released and explore themes in more in more in-depth, sophisticated way. 
And with that came the ability to break free of a lot of these restrictions in terms of dimensions and just the practicalities of printing a monthly book. So, talking about dimensions. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. Right. So, one example I wanted to show you was a uh, comparison of what what happens when you do something as simple as change those dimensions that were essentially the only way to print comics for such a long time, at least in America. Um, and so, so um, this is Watchmen. It's a pretty important comic from the night from 1986, and it was released as individual issues, but really it was meant to be a uh, full book. And this is it here, and uh, it was printed in standard comic book dimensions, which is this, as you can see, this very long kind of vertical way of doing things. This is 300, which you might remember it from the movie adaptation from a couple years ago, um, by Frank Miller. Um, it's kind of a postmodern retelling of uh, the Battle of Thermopylae with the Spartans versus the, uh, the Persians. And as you can see, he printed the book sort of in the opposite way. Instead of vertical, it's, it's a horizontal layout of the book. Um, it's actually, the length of a page is actually sort of two vertical pages opened up as like, a, as like a single image. So as you can see, his story is read in a much more horizontal way. Uh, his idea behind that was um, verticality is kind of a modern, kind of urban way to look at the world, and horizontal is a more kind of timeless, cla timeless classic way. So you can think about when you're in a city, you're doing a lot of up and down looking, and when you're in the country, you're doing a lot of panoramic left and right looking at the scenery. Um, and so in that way, he thought it, it would create this kind of more classic epic storytelling feel to the book. I think it was successful. <laughs> so, um, what are we talking about now? So, so now that you have like a standard dimension that you can deviate from, right? That, that creates an effect. Um, that affects the way we tell our stories in our book. So even though Apocalypse Man and Chinatown were printed in standard dimensions, our new book, Monkey Fest, is printed a little bit wider as a way of communicating. You want to say a little bit about why you chose to make the dimensions wider? Yeah, uh, Monkey Fist dimensions are something like 10 by 11.5. It's not quite a square, but it kind of reads as a square when you read the book. And again, as a comparison to a standard comic, it, that makes it much more wide as opposed to uh, the usual vertical up and down kind of way you read a comic book. Um, and there was a few ways to do it. Uh, that I should do that. One was, uh, taking Frank Miller's example, uh, to create this kind of more timeless epic kind of storytelling pacing where there's a lot more horizontal left and right scanning of a kind of this widescreen approach. And the other is um, it kind of resembles a storybook that way. It kind of looks like the dimensions of like a children's illustrated book and I think that kind of builds into that kind of fable kind of mythic storytelling that we were going for with the story. Yeah. And so in addition to you know manipulating things like the dimensions, there are other things about the physical printing process of the book that we can manipulate to tell the story. So for example, Chinatown is told in really high quality paper. The paper is really thick. In fact, we were talking like after we printed the book, maybe we went overboard, maybe the quality is too high. But but the thing is we, we know that was the kind of story we wanted to tell. And it's it's really satisfying, at least for me, when we go to comic book conventions and people pick up on this. That we were doing an interview. Uh, for like a web series on comics, and the guy was holding our book, and he was saying to the camera, "I hope that you viewers at home, I wish you could be here to hold the book. It's it's heavy. It feels the way this kind of story should be told." Okay. By contrast, Apocalypse Man is a black and white genre piece. You want to just open it up so people can see what I'm. It's got a staple binding instead of a perfect binding, and we actually told our printer, we said, "You know, we want this to feel like a 1980s Ninja Turtle comic. Can we print on a print? <laughs> And he said, well, newsprint smudges. And we said, well, give us the cheapest paper that doesn't smudge. <laughs> I mean, because the idea is that if it were a higher quality paper, if it was in full color, if it was perfect bound, it wouldn't feel like a black and white throwback genre piece. It wouldn't have the kind of grittiness of those 1980s comics that we were patterning them after. So um, unlike a lot of prose authors and text-based authors, we're very active in the printing process. So we were talking to some of our colleagues. We were doing that author's panel at Open Books, and another author, Wesley Chu, was saying, like, he didn't even get to pick what the cover looked like for his book. But we have to make all those decisions, and pretty early on, right? Brad can't illustrate until he knows the dimensions that he's working with. So a lot of what ends up being the last considerations for prose-based authors become some of the early decisions for us. What, you know, how big is the page? You know, is it going to be color black and white? These sorts of things. Uh, because we use the different elements within the book as storytelling devices, such as turning the page. So I want to... Uh, move to some other ways of manipulating expectations of standard comics um, to create effects as authors. So McLeod, who, who's, I think, most famous right now for writing about comics, also wrote comics for a long time. And one of uh, his books that I really enjoy is called Zot. Zot is about, um, I guess, it's about a superhero from another dimension who comes into this world and uh, starts dating a girl in our dimension. And uh, some of the supervillains from his world come into this world, and they go back and forth a lot. 
Um, it was uh, really uh, popular in the early 90s, and he did a lot of interesting things with comics. You can even see, so I read Understanding Comics before I read Zot, and then going back and reading Zot, I can kind of see what he was trying to figure out as a comic book author on the page as he was doing comics. But um, I want to lift up Zot number 33, which is called Normal, uh, which won uh, some kind of was it a Harvey Award? It won some kind of award for best single issue comic when it was released in 91. Normal tells a story of a girl named Terry who uh, is struggling with coming out. She's a lesbian, she's not sure if it's safe to come out. Zot, who's from another dimension, doesn't understand why it would be a problem to come out, and he has to kind of, to kind of talk through it. And it was his way in the 90s of kind of dealing with some of these social issues. Well, he couldn't decide how to end the book. Basically, Terry is, is really attracted to a friend of hers, and she's trying to say, like, should I tell her? Like, what should I do? And he wrote essentially two endings. First, he wrote this ending that he thought was more realistic to the world he lived in, where she decides to keep quiet, never speak up, and it ends with kind of really sad and really dark, and the two girls pass each other in the hallway, and that's the end of the book. He decided later, you know what? Actually, this book is a book that's always told from Zot's perspective, a perspective that's in the future, a perspective that's always hopeful, and he said, no, 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 no. Uh, she has to say something. And so he actually ends the book by having her turn and say, hey, wait up, I want to tell you something. And that's how the book ends. But he felt like he didn't want to lose that original ending because he thought it spoke to real life. So what he did was, you know, in his book, the book always ended on the left side of the page. And then there's a right side of the page that started the letters to the editor. You know, like people would write and say, hey, McLeod, your, your last book was terrible, or you know, whatever. And he would answer those things. So what he did was he put the dark ending on the left the letters on the right, and then when you turned, the page that should have been more letters was the rest of the story. And he got a ton of vitriolic hate mail from this because people would throw the book down after reading the first ending because they were so used to the standard. He was trying to manipulate their expectations in what a comic book should be. And he writes in the collected volume, which is uh, over here if you want to take a look at it later, um, that he has no idea how many people for kind of 30 years thought that's how his book ended. And then when they read this reprint, like finally understood, oh, that's what was supposed to happen. Um, and so when you, when you, when you put the, the reader in the driver's seat as an editor, a lot of unintended effects might happen. Right? So let's talk about some of the more experimental kind of ways of playing with expectation. This is a book called Burning Building Comics. Where's that? Actually, there it is. Um, so this book is vertical and it flips up when you read it. Okay, like this. So when you read the story, it flips up and then over across this way. Right? So what I'm showing here, actually, that's not one page, that's three pages. And there are multiple stories going on concurrently. This is supposed to be literally the stories of a building. This is the ground floor, that's the top floor. And as you read across and follow simultaneously vertically, you can see what's happening on the ground floor. The fire is spreading. This guy is here with his dog. Um, there's a, another fire happening on the third floor and up on the top floor. It looks like, I don't know, they're having a party or something. So this is a way to kind of use the physicality of the book. Like this book is the building. This is how we're going to tell that story. Um, this is one of my favorite kind of experiments. This is called Building Stories by Chris Ware. This giant box is the comic, right? Um, and inside the box are a bunch of little mini comics. And some of them are like vertical fold out, some of them are cloth bound, some of them um, are finished with like a nice shiny binding uh, with like really thick pages. And his idea was uh, that this whole box was the comic. You can read the, the component comics in any order that you want, and that ultimately you should leave these books laying around your house. So that people who visit you will just kind of pick up one piece, like maybe they're in the bathroom, or maybe they're just like poking around in the kitchen, and they kind of pick up one book and they read it. And people kept asking him, well, what order should I read the comics in? And he's like, well, that's, you know, that's up to you. That's the point of this book. Um, I heard him speak at the Chicago Alternative Comics Expo last year, Cake. And he was saying, you know, some of his frustration in people not wanting to take that interactive role in their comics. They wanted to be told the order in which they were going. And on the back of the box, there's actually a suggestion, like, oh, this would look really good on the coffee table, this would look good on your shelf, maybe that's what you want to do with it. But he got really mad because people took that as the prescription, like, oh, from that they extrapolated the order in which you should, it's all about a woman who's missing a leg and her relationships with different people in her life. And, but you can, I, I've tried rearranging the order and seeing what it does to the story, and it really, either way, it kind of loops into a really nice narrative. And, uh, but he said, you know, this is really just prescriptive. I, I want people to decide what to do with it. And the guy interviewing him was just so incredulous about that. He's like, no, but come on, you have to have an intent. I mean, look how big this box is. Like, what are people supposed to do with it? It doesn't fit 
on a bookshelf, and, and Chris Ware looked at him and goes, that's not my problem. <laughs> He's like, you're the, I'm, just the, I'm the artist here, you're the reader, it's your job to figure it out. So he uses the physicality of the books in a very, very, I think, interesting and very novel way. And so it's called Building Stories, and in some ways, it's, it's actually kind of meta, because this whole thing was an exploration of how buildings work. Um, in Ware's own words, he was saying, the interesting thing about buildings is a lot of the shapes you see, like perpendicular lines and stuff in cities, are not often found in nature. So he thinks that the study of buildings is really the study of the world people want to create for themselves. Like, what is the world that I want to live in? That's my building. And so he said, you know, it, the best thing was to tell the story in a way where you leave things around your house the way you would. That's what this book is all about, how we create our lives. And so he takes interactive physical storytelling to kind of that level. I also want to talk about digital comics, right? Because there are things you can do that aren't physical in the sense of holding a thing in your hands. You know, uh, uh, so some books are read online. Instead of turning pages, you're clicking buttons and scrolling your mouse. But it allows you to do a lot of interesting interactive things like here. So this is Zach Borman. Um, his work is often inspired by uh, video games. This is him called Link and the Windfish. So you can see he adds some animated uh, GIF images here of rain and the lantern. And then this one I really like. This is uh, called Splatterhouse, which is uh, influenced by a horror game uh, from I think it was on Sega Genesis. Uh, and so he gets to do all kinds of interesting effects with that and how you read it and scroll through your mouse in that kind of way. You're still the editor in the sense that the pacing and so on is in your control, uh, but it allows him to do some interesting uh, digital effects as well. So um, actually, now might be a good time to pause. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about storytelling in multiple formats. But are there any questions or thoughts about some of the stuff we've talked about so far? Yeah. Pluses about pluses and minuses about uh, putting comics on an iPad versus the physicality of the talking about. So, so pluses and minuses of reading it off of a tablet or something, an iPad or something, and having the physical book. Um, well, I'll, I'll let you say. I'll, I'll kind of give my thoughts, but uh, I'd invite you to say something too. Uh, for me, I think the question is um, not in like an objective way, which is a better way to tell a story, but what kind of comic are you trying to tell? Right. So, like Apocalypse Man, we, we released as a web comic. But in, in our minds, that was clearly not the, the, the way you're supposed to, like the, that's the derivative version, right? Because for it to be a throwback 80s style comic where there weren't any iPads, we couldn't tell the story digitally in the same way that it would be physically. But that's certainly not true for all things. In fact, so since Gorman is riffing off of video games, which is you know, kind of a digital electronic medium, I mean, for all I know, I mean, the, the prints might be not the ideal way to read his books. I don't know, do you have anything to add? Well, my first thought was it's harder to <coughs> analyze the digital comic. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's on my side of things. But uh, essentially, well, Lesson says it's right. I think it, it's the intention that's important. I think now that digital comics are really new, a lot of the big publishing companies like Marvel and DC are just taking their printed comics and releasing digital version of it. And to me, that just makes the digital version clearly inferior because the book was made to be printed, and you're reading it in the opposite medium. It'd be like watching Gravity on a little tiny TV instead of the guy next screen. It's, it's not the way that the, the original intent was, was envisioned. Um, but if a comic is created to be a uh, digital comic, um, I think that that I mean I think that that's great. I think it's exciting, and the possibilities of what you can do with a page are essentially endless when it's online. You know, I've thought of making comics where you know we're talking about dimensions. What if every single page would be a different dimension? You know, it's be impossible to do a printed book that way. It would look like some kind of crazy scrapbook. But <laughs> online, it would be very easy to read. It would, you know, maybe some pages scroll horizontally and some pages scroll vertically. Maybe some pages zoom in. Yeah, there's some digital panels that do that. Yeah, you go through like a window or something like that. You know, there's all sorts of things you can do. So I think it's about um, considering your medium and as part of your conception. And then the big challenge would be making a project that, could, that is multimedia that could truly be a different experience printed versus uh, digital versus any other, you know, any other way it could be read. And that the full experience of all of those things, the interactivity of consuming it in different media, that's the whole experience. Uh, that kind of thing. So it's it's, it's it creates more possibilities, which is always a good thing for an artist, but um, it makes you have to be smarter, too. <laughs> <laughs> Other thoughts or questions before we move on? Yeah. Um, the example of McLeod's uh, Zot, yeah. uh, the ending just made me think of like, the um, all the Avenger movies. They always have a little thing after <laughs> the, the credits, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and I never want to say. Um, but, yeah. but it just made me think, too. Sort of, uh, there just seems to be a, an obsession right now with turning comics into movies. Right. And I don't know if, if you think, I know with Watchmen, there was a lot of controversy over the, the movie. Right. People didn't like it. Um, but if you have any thoughts about, if you think that's a good thing, if you think that it's, uh, you know. 
Well, if I mean, it yeah. influence on writing of comics or... Yeah. Uh, well, a couple of things I want to say about like, the Avengers yeah. teaser. What I think is interesting about like Zod versus when you're talking about like the Marvel movies, the yeah. teaser thing. The teaser at the end of, not all, but most of those movies seem fairly incidental to understanding the movie as a whole. Right, right. Um, change. Zot, like changed, like the ending of Zot changed the whole book, right? Like in terms of like what, what kind of world do we live in and what kind of world are we shooting for? Like if you miss the last bit, you kind of don't have a certain lens to read the whole book through. Yeah. Whereas the movies, they kind of know, like people are like, oh, I gotta throw my popcorn away. You know, like yeah. they kind of know not everyone's gonna stay for that. It's like for like the hardcore nerds. Right, so, right. Like, yeah, <laughs> stick around and figure out what's next or whatever. So, so there's that difference. Like how important is that little switcheroo with the end? And also it's become so common now, it's like not even really a surprise in movies, I don't think. Like I always, well, I'm kind of a big nerd, but I always say to the end because I kind of assume it's gonna happen. Right, right. But then the other question you asked was like, how do I feel about the obsession of turning comic books into movies. Like, I, you know, I think it's fine as long as we understand films to be kind of its own thing. The Watchmen thing was, was, I mean, I think complicated by two reasons. One is it's been elevated in like comics lore to being like the, the Bible of right. comics, which I don't, you know. Um, and so like people were gonna be upset no matter how it was interpreted. And not everything that can be done in a comic can be done in a film. Yeah. But also, I mean, Alan Moore is just, I mean, he's pretty staunchly against his books being translated into things in a way that I am not. Like, I don't have his sense of, it does some injury to the literature to, to reinterpret it this way. And I will say, too, that at least, especially in Watchmen, there are a few effects he does between panels that it seems like he wanted it in a movie. I'm thinking of the time where, remember that part where there's like a picture frame? It's like a picture of a bunch of people, like a bunch of superheroes posing for a, a photo, and then there's like a flash bulb, and then it goes into the flashback. Like, I feel like that was better done in film than it was. Yeah, in or whatever he has dialogue juxtaposed against an image that doesn't match. Right. That seems like a voiceover. That's, it feels like something he took from cinema. Right. So, so he I denies that. <laughs> but I, th I think he's lying. I think. He's lying. <laughs> I mean, pardon me for disagreeing with the great god Alan Moore, but I, I, I think he's lying. I think he was using cinematic devices in his comics, yeah. and so that kind of begs for it to be yeah. up on the big screen. I mean, other parts maybe not so, but I, I just don't believe it. <laughs> yeah? I have a question. Have you guys considered maybe um, doing a comic where you have a physical book that has a dialogue with a digital? Um, um, I've, um, there, I, I've picked up one comic that um, is similar to that, that has, there was a physical book but the physical book was essentially supposed to be in conjunction with a website right. that was more interactive. So yeah, there's things like that, and actually uh, a little bit outside of the realm of comics now, but um, there was a, uh, David Cronenberg had some kind of museum show recently, and there was an online website that was essentially like a mini Cronenberg film where you kind of created this artificial creature, kind of like a nightmarish version of that. Was that movie that just came out? <laughs> Which, where he talked to the computer and fell in love with the computer. Oh, her. Yeah, it was kind of like a, the Cronenberg version of that, and it would create this weird little mutant, and then when you went to the gallery show, you would pick up your mutant that, you know what I mean? So, yeah, these kind of multimedia things, I think, are some of the more exciting things going on. And, you know, with, uh, you know, a lot of what comics are going through now, these kind of growing pains of becoming an art form, as opposed to just this kind of mass media thing, uh, video games are kind of doing the same thing now, and to me that's really exciting, seeing, um, seeing all these different uh, platforms kind of coming of age, and, and seeing the weird twists and turns it takes before the critics come in and ruin everything for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so ask, what's the what's the market like now? I mean, where are physical comic books being sold? Yeah, where are we selling? Yeah, there um, comic book stores still exist. There was kind of first like eight comics on Fifty Fifth Street. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there was kind of a boom in the '90s where there was kind of this this kind of crazy market where people thought that they could collect comics and like it would be worth millions of dollars later on and of course it didn't work because if everyone's buying this issue it's not valuable right and saving it because everyone has it i mean it was a very specific market you know when you hear about the stories about these like superman number ones like millions of dollars it's because people didn't keep comics back then they're all trash so there's only a few copies of it left and, you know it's a piece of memorabilia you know all sorts of things and you, know, you can't manufacture a collector's market, it doesn't, it doesn't work. So it kind of crashed and burned, there was kind of like a bubble that exploded, but comic book stores are still around. And there's of course, uh, usually nowadays a comic book session and a humongous manga section in all bookstores. Of course, bookstores are starting not to exist anymore either. Um, right. right, but um, so digital is, is the realm where things are starting to branch out. I think Marvel are one of them, I think, but maybe both of them are really big now on like, when their physical issue gets released every month, the digital issue, it gets released on the exact same day. So they're trying to create kind of like inequality, like, like both of them are equally legitimate. As I've said before, I don't think that that's true. But <laughs> the point is, it could, it could, there could be a time where it is true, or even the digital version is the, is the superior version, the printed version is for, for old fogies. You know? so, um, so yeah, it, it's kind of, 
join. I, I, I find that, I, I, what I've heard, I'm not sure, because I'm, I'm not like an industry expert, but I've heard that the movies aren't really doing that much for comic book sales. They, you know, people go see, it's not like, there's some percentage of people who see the movie and be like, oh, I want to read more about Spider-Man. But right? most people don't do that. I don't do that. I don't see it in many years and go, oh, i got to read a bunch more Avengers comics now because I like that movie. So I don't know how much that is. It's helping them cover the losses of their comic books. I guess. <laughs> right. but, uh, yeah. Uh, I remember there was a, and I'm one of the old fogies. I remember there was a, a big discussion, I think back in the 80s with Calvin and Hobbes, that he, yeah. he felt restricted by the format and he wanted to be, I wanted it to be art and he, he didn't fit in the format. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you guys deal with that? Do you, do you use as a basis the format and then do the, the art or does the art come first and then you have to format it? Right, so, yeah. Well, um, Nowadays, what we've done, and for anyone, it's, it's so much more easier to self-publish nowadays than it yep. was uh, in the past, where you had to go through a publisher and a printing house and that kind of thing. So we kind of have the luxury and also the burden of choosing, all, making all the decisions ourselves, what kind of paper quality, how we want the book to look, so we can do those things. Of course, all our, no art is created in a void, so you want to contextualize it against what is the standard. So if we change the dimensions of the book, we're going to have to realize that people are used to seeing it a certain way. Um, so, but yeah, the Calvin and Hobbes, uh, Bill Watterson is an interesting kind of thing where he's kind of, he was clearly kind of having to compromise his art because of the format that he was in, which is a very rigid weekly format, you get this much space for a comic, even in terms of what kind of colors you can use in printing, I'm sure there was a lot of things he had to kind of figure out, um, but created, created, worked out, I think created, created good art, I think sometimes those limitations kind of work to the art, artist's advantage. Like I said, it makes you have to be smarter. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, if you have total freedom to do something, in a way, you can kind of kind of sabotage yourself because the possibilities are endless. Whereas if you have restrictions imposed on you, like the comic has to be the X amount of pages, you can only use these 100 colors, which you, which all the way up until the 90s was the case. There was very, the color palette for comics were extremely limited. It makes you have to make kind of really decisions you wouldn't normally have to make, and it creates interesting art. In my opinion. And actually, that Calvin and Hobbes piece is actually a good segue into where we're going next. Because in the case of Hobbes, I'm, I'm right that it started as a strip, right? Like in the, in the paper? Yeah. yeah. It started as a strip. And, but it's since then been republished in other formats, like collected into big novels and that sort of thing. And that's kind of where we're going next. So we're going to use Frank Miller again, since it is an example of uh, the same kind of content, the same kind of story being told in multiple formats. Yeah. So let's look in. Like yes, I'm going to show. Uh, okay, so Sin City was is a, is sort of an anthology series that uh, Frank Miller put out in the 90s, and again, it was ad adapted into a movie, you might remember, by Robert Rodriguez. Yeah. Um, so, orig so the, uh, originally, uh, the issues come out like a standard comic book issue, mm -hmm. like you think of, back to the old newspaper format, monthly, you're reading a chapter of the story. Uh, but once they're finished, they're eventually collected into a graphic novel story like this. And at least in my opinion, it's clear that Frank Miller writes his monthly issues to be a graphic novel. He, uh, he, they're paced in a funny way that if you read the individual issues, people get upset. Like, mm -hmm. like you know, that was like two hours past in this book and I have to wait a whole month for the next two hours where you, know, <laughs> you read it as a full book and it's clear that, okay, well, I was meant to read this in one city. And so it was published um, as, a, as a graphic novel. And so, you know, that's kind of the real version of the book. When the movie came out, he had the opportunity to republish the comics and he specified that he wanted it in this tinier kind of digest size book, um, as he put it, so that it can fit in the pocketbook, he said. Um, and so you can see right away um, how that would affect the reading experience of a, of a graphic medium. Uh, you know, how large the image is, um, whether you're reading it you know, on a, in a kind of a serial month-to-month -month way, or if you're reading it in one city. And then even you know, more compared to like a, a large, oversized printing of a book, where you almost get this kind of peripheral vision of the visual art, how that would affect your experience. And so speaking to Frank Miller's um, kind of desire to make a small digest version of it that's easily portable, um, just one more last illustration of how this can affect um, the way a piece of art like a comic is consumed and uh, writ, uh, read uh, in Japan. Uh, the smaller manga, what they call comics is manga, the smaller digest size is their standard format. It's not the newspaper size that we have in the West. And, you know, it's a chicken egg thing. I don't know which one came first. But either way, the, the state of things are uh, manga covers a much more diverse range of genres and topics. Uh, essentially, you know, like any other kind of form of literature, you could find a manga about any topic there is. And it's also read by a much more diverse uh, strata of people. It's, it's, there's, there's no set demographic. There's, you know, adults, male, female, kids, everyone reads it. And so, to me, it's quite evident that the format of the book ultimately con 
ultimately um, affects the way that people view it. You know, um, when it's made to look like a normal book, people read it as, as a book, people accept it as literature. When it's made to look like a big floppy magazine for kids, <laughs> that's what it becomes. Yeah, so. Yeah. That's right, that's right. So, in the case of, I mentioned we've got another book coming out, Monkey Fist, right? We made a decision, we're running a Kickstarter campaign right now, which is what we were doing in October 2012 when we were here last time. Um, and one thing we're doing is we're releasing the book in two formats. We're releasing kind of the standard version, the, mon the Monkey Fist, the graphic novel, but we're also releasing a special edition, um, which we're calling the Rage Edition, which is not unlike Watchmen being printed in, a, in kind of a special way in addition to its kind of regular format. And I can sit here and like tell you about what's in the Rage Edition and so on, but we actually made a video for the Kickstarter, which I think is really fun. So instead of just talking about it and like scrolling through a bunch of slides, I, I'd rather just play you the video and you can see for yourself uh, the what Monkey Fist is going to look like. Of, of the experience, and are is there anybody 
um, in the comic book world who's trying to recreate um, sort of a public uh, experience with comic books, like an individual um, piece is created or only one comic book is made. And, and is there anything like that? And, or, and just could you speak a little bit about, yeah. connect it back to the beginning? There's, the there's definitely um, art books, um, not just in comics, but in all kinds of books that printmakers will make where there's literally just one or maybe five total. And you know, I think even the Art Institute had, had a, uh, uh, an exhibit of them a, little, a few months ago where uh, you know, the, the, they were behind glass cases, so I was like, well, that doesn't really help me. I mean, I know it exists, but, okay, but, uh, but you know, where, where they'll literally, they'll all be handmade and hand printed, and that is, that becomes the art, art object, so it puts a little bit more in that classical gallery type feel. There's like, some at the library if you want to hand Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they probably put on like gloves or something like that. Like, the Depends thing. on the, yeah. <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> right, in terms of like, what is lost between the experience, I want to put it in terms of that. I think that they are different. And so those those things should be considered when putting the art together. I mean, I think that inevitably something that's mass produced it loses some of that, you know, what I'll call elitism of like a gallery experience, and it becomes more of a mass appeal thing. And so there is that high and low art contrast that happens. Um, the way I try to tell to people is, it would be folly to say that there is not a difference between what people call fine art and mass art for the masses, pop culture art. They are different, but I would argue that they're equally valuable. That they're, they're, there's there's not a hierarchy to them. It is just, they're just different. And consuming one in the other way, so as we're talking about consuming something mass produced like comics as a piece of fine art, or vice versa, is something that artists have addressed since Andy Warhol, uh, Jeff Koons, and that, that tension is, is, I think, something that could make the art even more interesting. That's weird. <laughs> that's, that's, that, was, that's, that, was, yeah, that was pretty obvious. I don't know what that means. <laughs> the other piece of your question about like the public experience, like is there a way, rather than, it, that was just part of your question, yeah, right? Is yeah, there yeah. I actually think things like Kickstarter are part of that, yeah. pub, it's, it's sharing the creation process with the world, right? So in the case of um, several, probably not in the case of ours, but um, for some of these, like, unless the public decides to get behind a project, it doesn't exist. Like the art of which will never come into being unless the public gets behind it. In our case, that's probably not true. We would still print books without Kickstarter, but would we print the Rage Edition? Probably not without a successful Kickstarter campaign. So that piece of art, the Rage Edition, is completely dependent on the public getting together and saying, no one person, we, you know, our GoFundMe goal is 15,000. We are not expecting one, you know, patron of the arts to come up with 15,000. That's a public movement, right? It relies on people giving what they can and also telling other people to give what they can. And so together we print the book together. Otherwise, it's just never going to see the light. And the web comics where they're right. released sort of in real time. I'd not, like the artist will like you know put out a page a week or two pages a week, and he'll get feedback instantly. Uh, it's another example of the way that there could kind of be a public experience of reading it. And of course, even old-fashioned comic books that were printed on a monthly basis, now they have a certain lead time where they might have a few issues in the can. But you know, of course, they're affected by the editorial, editorially by the comments they get, the feedback from the readers. So I think I think in, in any art form that is kind of released in a certain kind of periodical schedule, there is inevitably going to be that feedback loop of uh, the viewer and the artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm curious about your creative process and where these ideas come from. You know, monkey fish, octopus, man, and is there a system that you use or some sort of a schedule? That right. I mean, for me, that... comics take so long to make. You know, the, the just the process is so long, and you know, just the illustration, the scripting, all of that that I would never be afraid that I finished a project and I had no idea what, I had, well, I'm out of ideas, you know? Like, there, there's, there's almost an unlimited, you know, it, it's the opposite. There's never enough time to execute all the things you want to do. In terms of what idea to choose, like, how do I know, you know, which one to, like, kind of work on and develop into something, you know? You could have some idea and realize, oh, wait, that was really nothing. That's not worthy of publication, and then this one was. Um, that was, for us, a very calculated uh, decision. We sat down, we said, okay, well, what book makes most sense is our first story to work on, and that was Chinatown. And uh, even beyond that, at any given time, we wanted our body of work, so when we have two books and we have three books, to all work together to create a coherent kind of sense of things. Um, I, I'm sure a lot of artists don't work that way. I'm sure they just kind of go with whatever one speaks to them at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I, think it, I think, to me, it's like the more thought you put into anything, the better. I think there's people who are like, oh, don't overthink things. I'm like, no, over, over, <laughs> so just, I'm just thinking it's overthinking. Impossible. So, um, <laughs> So yeah, but in terms of coming up with the ideas, for me at least, it's more about being selective of which ideas to develop as opposed to just you know finding the inspiration. Yeah. How do you coordinate back and forth between the images and the story? Does sure. one come before the other? Uh, we, we have a, we, for the books we've done, we've always had a, a pretty fleshed out script before the illustration happens. 
now we have the advantage of me being the artist and co-writer. So yeah. even as we're scripting, I could start thinking of how things are going to look on the pages. Uh, traditionally, when there's artist writer teams, though, that may not happen. Right. Um, but there's no set kind of pattern for that to happen. Some are very collaborative, as Watchmen was. Alan Moore gets all the credit, but Dave Gibbons, who was the illustrator, also helped with a lot of the um, idea ideas in the world building. And but other times, it's literally just the artist gets a script completely finished yeah. with like really detailed panel layouts. Panel one, this guy eats a hamburger. <laughs> That's who, you know, he coughs. Yeah. And they just they ex execute it like it's a assembly line. Mm -hmm. So there's no set pattern. I tend to think that if all the creatives can be involved from the get-go, and even better if the artist and writer are the same person as the case with Frank Miller, it creates a more coherent, cohesive yeah. end product. Um, but you know, that there's been plenty of comics with pairs of artists collaboration that have been just as good. So yeah. what do I know? I mean it's it's not a coincidence that Almost all of the examples we gave in this presentation is an example of a writer and the artist being the same person. Most of them were Frank Miller was, McLeod was, um, Chris Ware is, etc. So, um, and actually, we should say even though Alan Moore uh, is just a writer, he is actually an artist in his own right outside mm -hmm. of comic books. So he still has the mind for graphic design and layout. So I think that's that's relevant. And in terms of the actual process of Brad and I, the three books actually look pretty different. So Chinatown was the case of us writing different scenes and sending it to the other person for editing. Brad wrote the entire first draft of Apocalypse Man um, on his own, and I was more or less an editor. In the case of Monkey Fist, I took my first draft about as far as I could go, and then Brad stepped in and fixed the things that weren't working, working and helped finish it off. So it's not like we had one process for all three books. It kind of varies on the, based on the project. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just, uh, this is a little off topic, and you might not know, but I. I think everything that you discussed was by a male author. Yes. And I'm just wondering where where the comic industry is right now with female authors mm -hmm. yeah. outside of Alice. I think that um, you'll see, yeah, well, and, and you know, she's an indie self kind of published person. Right. Um, the self publishing scene is getting bigger and bigger. Um, and the uh, kind of the big two, Marvel and DC, are getting less and less relevant for all sorts of reasons, that being one of them. They're kind of stuck in this kind of outdated mode now where, where they're just kind of creating comics for this person that doesn't really even exist anymore, you know, these stories that have been told over and over again. So that diversity element in terms of not just, you know, societal good, but in terms of creating good art is very important. And when we go to conventions and stuff like that, you'll see that there's there's almost maybe even just as many female creators out there putting that putting things out. Um, so I think it's only it's just a matter of time. I mean uh, when you look at the broad history of it, obviously it's still dominated by male artists. But right, if you look at the scene right now, that's not the case. Yeah. So in ten years from now, when we kind of figure out which ones are the important works being made now, you know, they will be added to the collective story of comic books, and that's great. I mean, thank you. Yeah, um, I have a question actually about the audience that you had in mind when writing Monkey Fist. Mm -hmm. Who who do you expect? Um, to read it, and, and who do you want to read it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, to answer your last one, I want everybody to read it. <laughs> I, I don't have any sense in which uh, that there's any pretty audience that I like don't want to read or anything. But in terms of who do I think would read it, or, or uh, I'll say this. So actually, this is a conversation we had uh, as we were finishing up the scripts. We were trying to figure out if the book was like too dark or too weird, or if the artwork was, or if things were too experimental or whatever. And um, I think it was you that, I mean, lots of people give me this advice, but I kind of credit you with the like, camera home for me. So you gotta, at the end of the day, you got to make the art that you want to experience. Like, you have to, I, I can't, we can't change the stories that we have to tell just to, you know, concern things. Uh, but in terms of who I think would be interested in this thing, I think this book has a lot of import. Um, I mean, the language I would use is, is some, as a proud digital school grad, I think it has a lot of theological implications that are not explicit in it. Like, I, I didn't, we didn't set out to write a theological piece, but in so far as it's concerned with meaning, with the question of how do you make meaning out of your life? Um, how do you, you know, what, what are the ways in which you live or engage the world or not that gives you value or that or where you can kind of locate value? That seems to me one of the through lines running through all of our books was certainly Monkey Fist. And um, I think that has a kind of universal appeal to it. People want to think about that. And then the last thing to say is in some ways we were, um, who, who the audience was, which would be people who love art and people who love comics, right, was in some ways verified for us at the comic book convention table. So when we were, all last year when we were at comic book conventions in here and Detroit and Louisville and wherever else we went, although these were the two books we had, we had preliminary artwork for Monkey Fist on display. And everyone, like not everyone, but, but by far that print sold better than all the other 
posters we had. Um, even though that book didn't exist yet. I, I thought for sure they would like buy Apocalypse Man and then buy the print that went with it. But that was actually pretty uncommon. Most most of the prints we sold were for Monkey Fist, and people were saying, like some of them didn't have no, they didn't recognize the, the makeup from the Monkey Fist uh, Chinese opera. They didn't have, they may not have any recognition of the Chinese literature on which it's based, but they said that looks interesting. I want to read that. Um, tell you know, I'll come back when that book is out or something. Do you have any sense of yeah, the other thing too is I just think thematically if you look at all our books, um, there's a sort of idea that there's this kind of shared pop culture experience yeah, right. that people of our age, uh, and really I, I don't know when it would start, but of a certain generation when media kind of pop culture kind of exploded, and especially nowadays with the internet, that people kind of have access to any kind of uh, material on anything at any given time. So that everyone is extremely genre savvy. They understand the conventions of things. They understand uh, references to a kind of things that, nothing's obscure anymore is my point. So if we have, if like, oh, this is something from when we were kids, if we thought of an inside joke, we put it in there, well, everyone's actually gonna get it. And if they don't, all they have to do is type it into Google yeah. and they would make them get it. So <laughs> there was a point at some point where the way I would, it's like pop culture became kind of self-aware, like kind of like a, singu like a singularity Skynet thing. And, <laughs> and it's, so, so um, all kind of relevant pop culture kind of comments on itself at the same time. So the audience, you know, so, so the audience and the creator kind of become one of the same. In fact, even the art object itself becomes one of the same because all of it is a reference to itself and there's kind of this feedback and like that. So in a way, the audience is kind of inherent in the whole ideation of it. If that's not true, then we messed up big time. I mean, I think people laughing at your Skynet reference is a good example of right. that. It's like, will people get it or not? And I think um, you were the one that kind of said that, you know, people will recognize quality even if they didn't go to art school the way that you did and that sort of thing, that if we, you know, make a quality product, right, like put, you know, that the, the, the work is done, the art is done, and so on, that that will be recognized by people. Even if they, even if they didn't walk into the comic book store saying like, man, if there was only a book of reinterpreting a Chinese folklore vis-a-vis -vis fast food and the meaning of life, like, oh, there it is, you know, like, like, like they, don't, they don't have to go in, in, in a different way than people do walk in comic books like, oh, I, you know, I, I'm looking for a new superhero comic or something, you know, like, there might be people actually doing that in other kinds of Books, but I don't, you know, for ours, we're not banking on people necessarily zeroing in on the, the plot content. Right? Yeah, Marvin. Can I ask? Just, I was going to ask about plot and character. Yeah. And the medium of the graphic novel as to does it, um, is it better on plot than character or the other way around? Huh. Or, you know, be, and, and I, I want to say explicitly vis a vis um, a literary novel. I think that um, it, 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 it's kind of has, I think it's better, well, if you say it's better than me as opposed to like kind of the traditional comic book, I would say in that case it's better at both. <laughs> uh, I think that like with, um, like with novels and like with <coughs> novels, um, there, are, there are certain kind of categories of graphic novels that have a very specific audience and a very specific style, and you'll find that kind of character driven stuff in a lot of the indie kind of self-published books because that, they're coming from the same place as like literary novels would come from. Um, um, so basically what I think is when you have a work that uh, the more the artist can control the final product, which obviously would be the case of a self-contained book like this, the better results you're going to get. So um, in terms of thematic exploration, whether it be through plot or character or those kind of things, they're all going to work better if the artist has, um, you know, doesn't have to fit the kind of grind that you would get and the kind of compromises you have to get when looking through kind of a big studio type system where it's like you have deadlines to match and, and marketing to consider. So I would say that, yeah, I would say yes to your question on all counts. The other thing to offer is McLeod, who I referenced earlier, doing work on how comics work or how effective they are. His argument is that graphic storytelling um, is inherently more empathetic uh, than um, prose or text based. I mean, I mean, I mean, it was going to depend on the, the quality of the writing and, and the talent of the artist and that sort of thing. But on the whole, he, he makes the claim that when you look at an illustration of, say, another person, the, the less photorealistic it is, the more you imagine your, yourself in that person's shoes. That is, that the act of interpreting a character in a comic is, um, is the act of empathy. It's something that I've used with some of my students in pastoral care as a chaplain. Um, for my, people in my practicum class, we're going to do that a week from Friday uh, with, a, with a book called Bottomless Belly Button by Dash Shaw. Um, and so it, it, there's a way in which you can explore that space, right? I don't I mean, it will depend on how good the individual creator is versus whoever you're comparing her to, but that's something that uh, kind of you, you have advantage of right off the bat. Yeah, I'm just curious, 
For, yeah. Looks like we're pretty much out of time now, and I know people are slipping out to classes, including my own, especially one third. Um, so um, we'll, we're going to stick around. So if you're here, you can take a look at what we've got, um, talk to us. Thank you so much for having us again. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School.